I will briefly show how a peptide bond is formed. Basically, a peptide bond is that bond which connects two amino acids together. So let's say we have two amino acids here. I drew them slightly differently. Here on the yellow one, I uh, fleshed out the bonds of the carboxyl group. For the blue one, I fleshed out more of the amino group. Now, if you go back to organic chemistry, there could be a possible reaction between a carboxyl group and an amino group, wherein we can assume that the nitrogen of this amino group can be our nucleophile, such that the lone pair, of course, given the conditions that some, some sort of enzyme will catalyze this, can go to the carbonyl carbon and substitute this OH. This OH will be a leaving group eventually, meaning it goes away. If that also happens, the nitrogen will have excess bonds and will also have to get rid of one of its hydrogens. Now, if that happens, you can notice that we actually got rid of H, OH, water in short, and after that, we can just casually copy everything. So literally, I'm just going to write everything. So you can actually fast forward to the point I'm done drawing this, but I'll make this quick. So I have this C double bond O, and then uh, take note that I have this green bond, which is now the new bond to the nitrogen here. And all I have to do is to draw the blue one. And then, let me speed it up. All right. So this is what we have after the reaction above. Technically speaking, this reaction can be called a condensation reaction. Normally, when you say condensation, it means a reaction where there is loss of water. However, you can also call this a transpeptidation reaction. Uh, more of the context when we go to the central dogma, because the idea is when you try to connect two amino acids together, or one amino acid and an existing peptide, you're just making the peptide longer. And therefore, the bond that I actually have here, this is what we're going to refer to as the peptide bond, which, as you can see, connects the two amino acids, it's just one, two amino acids together. And also, if you look at the peptide bond here, it actually resembles pretty much an amide bond, right? Because in the first place, if I have a reaction between an amino group and a carboxyl group that was called a mono, sorry, aminolysis in organic chemistry, our expected result is an amide in the first place. Now, once you have connected two amino acids together, we could actually give a name to this since we have something that's made up of two amino acids, I can call this a dipeptide. So take note that the prefix here depends on how many amino acids are present, not on how many peptide bonds are formed. In fact, you can see here clearly that if I have a dipeptide, I only have one peptide bond. So that will go on and on and on. So probably if you have, let's say, a tripeptide, three amino acids, that would be two peptide bonds. If I have, let's say, a pentapeptide, so five amino acids, I have four peptide bonds. It will always be one uh, less than the total number of amino acids. Moreover, we also have something unique about the amide bond. Take note that if you can recall, since I have an oxygen here with a lone pair, and then my carbon here is sp2, in organic chemistry, you can assume that there could be a lone pair delocalization here, resonance, which there can be a situation wherein the carbon here would have the single bond O, and then the double bond can be temporarily moved to the nitrogen. So meaning there's actually this possibility that there's some kind of double bond-like character in this peptide bond. And so, in fact, a lot of biochemistry textbooks describe the peptide bond to have some partial, as in they literally use this word every single time. Well, not really every single time, but in most books I've read, partial double bond character. And basically, it's trying to tell us that it's a relatively strong bond. Of course, compared to a single bond, a double bond has additional strength. And also, given that, that um, if this has some kind of delocalization, the double bond will extend all the way to this area. And remember that carbon with a, a carbon with double bond has a planar geometry, you can actually imagine the area or the region 
around the peptide bond as a flat or a planar uh, surface that makes up the rigidity or some kind of shape of the peptides. All right. Now, since we have a dipeptide, which is the smallest possible peptide, we can actually flesh out some of the parts here, which have names. So you can clearly see that in this dipeptide, one end here on the left has a free amino group, and that's the only part that will have a free amino group. This one would be called the N-terminus. Usually, you will find the N-terminus at the leftmost part as it is drawn on paper because, remember, the amino acids that we're always using are the L-amino acids. So, it's expected you find the amino groups at the left. And the area at the rightmost part, which has a free carboxyl group and is the only area with a free carboxyl group in the entire peptide, is the C-terminus. The individual amino acids, like these, this yellow one and the blue one, are actually referred to as residues. They're called like that because, well, in the first place, if this was the original amino acid, take no note, there was a part of the amino acid that was removed. So basically, you know, this thing right here is a leftover after the water has been removed. So that's where we get the word residue. Although take note that in the succeeding discussions, whenever I use the word residue, I'm referring only to the R group because most of the time the peptide bond is not really unique compared to the individual R groups of the amino acids. So therefore, for, for example, I have a peptide here below. It's quite longer. Let's try to see what we have discussed so far. So if I ask you, how could I call this peptide based on the number of amino acids? So you need to have the skill to be able to determine how many are there. So I can see here, maybe I could just use the residues as a clue. So since I have one residue, or the R groups, I mean, one, two, three, four. So I have four amino acids. So it's just right to call this a tetrapeptide. And uh, of course, what if you are asked how many peptide bonds are there? I mean, you can literally manually count them. In that case, there are all you need to do are to is to find the amide bonds. The answer is three. But of course, I told you a while ago, all you need to do is for a shortcut is to get the number of the amino acids, deduct one, and the answer will be three as well. And then if you're asked what is the amino acid at the end terminus, all you need to do is to identify what amino acid is here, or what is the amino acid at the C terminus, then you can just find what amino acid is here based on the R group that's drawn there. Or for example, you're asked, identify the second amino acid. You always count starting at the, the, the end terminus, the leftmost part. So the second one is this one because it's second starting from the end terminus. Mm -hmm. So this is basically the, the, the detail of every single peptide, be it two amino acids or even 2,000 amino acids long. Now I need to add something. It's not all the time that when we discuss amino acids or peptides, we're going to see amino acids combining. There are cases wherein we will discuss amino acids actually separating or dissociating. And of course, that means I'm going backward. If I'm going backward, it actually means I'm also going to do the opposite of condensation, wherein if in condensation there was a loss of water, the opposite process needs the addition of water. And there is a perfect word that you can remember from organic chemistry wherein we use water to split something apart. And that is the word hydrolysis. And that's perfect because normally in organic chemistry, the product of hydrolysis would give us, I mean, one, one of them at least is a carboxylic acid. And that's correct, right? Because if I go back, I actually form a COOH from an amide originally. So hydrolysis is the opposite of condensation. Condensation means to join, hydrolysis means to separate. One final note. Although sometimes the word peptide and protein are used interchangeably, it should be noted that the word protein is reserved for the much longer chains of amino acids. However, since textbooks vary in terms of the limit, like how would I say it's a protein and not a peptide, how many amino acids long, I'm not going to give a definite number here. It's better for you to search on your notes or on your prescribed textbook for the exact number, just to make sure.